Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Trainer, the Dean of Georgetown Law, and it's my honor and my pleasure uh, to introduce this first set of FTC hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. Uh, and we at Georgetown Law are very pleased to be host to this event. And I think it's very fitting uh, that we're here. Georgetown Law's connection to antitrust and consumer protection is longstanding and very deep. Dean Robert Petoskey served as Bureau Director, Commissioner, and then Chair of the FTC over his long and distinguished career. Numerous agency leaders have been graduates of Georgetown Law. Um, most recently, uh, our current FTC Chair, Joe Simons, who will be hearing from shortly. Um, also Commissioner nominee Christine Wilson, former DOJ Assistant Attorney General Christine Varney. I uh, saw so Monique Fortenberry, exec Deputy Executive Director of the FTC. Uh, we're very proud of having educated so many of the leaders of the FTC. Uh, and among our current faculty, David Vladek, who's at the end of our panel today, was Director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Uh, Howard Schlansky was Director of the Bureau of Economics. Uh, Professor Steve Salop was both a senior official in the FTC's Bureau of Economics and a mentor to Chairman Simon and, and Christine Wilson. Actually, uh, Chair, Chair and I were just talking about how his time at Georgetown Law had really prepared him in every way for uh, the career that you had. So um, we were just very proud. And it's appropriate, and it's particularly appropriate, I think, because in some way these hearings are intended to follow uh, the path that was set by the FTC's Global Competition and Innovation Hearings, uh, which were held in 1995 when Bob, uh, Bob Potofsky, was the FTC's chair. So we can look forward over the course of these hearings to a serious, insightful, and interesting set of discussion on some of the most pressing questions facing antitrust and consumer protection policy. Now, don't take my thunder, OK? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just kind of. Don't, don't expect too much until you hear from the chair who will bring up your expectations. Uh, the FTC will be continuing its hearings at locations across the country. And over the next several months, it will be exploring new ideas and approaches to its historic statutory mission. And for those of you who want to hear more about the antitrust issues of the day, right here at Georgetown Law, uh, our Global Antitrust Symposium, which is now in its 12th year, and is one of the most uh, prominent antitrust conferences outside of the ABA spring meeting, uh, will take place in this room in about two weeks. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to congratulate the FTC for its initiative and hard work in organizing these public hearings. And now I'd like to call to the podium the Director of Office of Policy Planning, Bilal Saeed. Okay, I, I won't take long except to thank everybody for coming and uh, uh, tell people a little bit about what we'll do today. Um, we'll turn to the chair in just a minute, but I just want to tell everybody this event is being webcast. Uh, the webcast will be posted to the FTC's website uh, shortly after um, we conclude. Uh, the session is being transcribed and the, tra and the transcript will be posted uh, quickly. Um, tomorrow's planned session, <coughs> excuse me, tomorrow's planned session has been canceled because of concern about the weather, but it will be rescheduled and the, you know, we'll make the effort to reschedule it here at Georgetown uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, some of the, my FTC colleagues will be passing out question cards. Uh, if uh, members of the audience have questions that they'd like to put to the panel, they should uh, write them on the card and uh, raise their hand and we'll come collect them. Um, we have an open comment process and so we encourage people to continue to comment. Uh, that comment process will be open through probably the end of February. Um, but uh, we encourage people to comment on what they hear today, both what is presented and what is discussed. Um, and then uh, all presentations made here will be posted on the website. And as I noted, the transcript of the session will be posted. Uh, so um, I'd say uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the chairman, and uh, he'll, he'll kick us off to get started. All right. Well, th thank you so much, Bilal. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Good morning. 
On behalf of all of us at the Federal Trade Commission, I want to thank you for coming to the opening of our hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. Our goal is to make these hearings as informative, insightful, and consequential as possible, covering some of the most important competition and consumer protection policy and enforcement issues of the day. We believe that we are situated to do just that. These hearings, as has been discussed already, are modeled on the ones that were held back in 1995 by then Chairman Bob Potofsky, who in his opening remarks said at the time, these hearings are designed to restore the tradition of linking law enforcement with a continuing review of economic conditions to ensure that the laws make sense in light of contemporary competitive conditions. We intend to continue that same tradition with these hearings. We are very fortunate to have a large group of highly respected participants representing a diverse range of views, including academics, practitioners, enforcement officials, and representatives from public interest groups. And I am proud that we are opening the hearings at Georgetown University Law Center, where Chairman Potofsky spent much of his career when he was not otherwise at the FTC and where I received my initial antitrust education to a significant extent from Professor Potofsky. So today I want to talk about why the Commission is holding these hearings. Almost 30 years ago, I came to the FTC the first of my three times. At the tail end of the Commission's adoption of a significantly revised approach to antitrust enforcement. This change, which began in 1981, and was implemented to a large extent by Tim Muris, who was two or three people to my left here. Uh, this change, which began in 1981, reflected new learning that had begun to influence Supreme Court antitrust doctrine. It was primarily driven by the scholarship of academics, the most prominent, Phil Arita, Don Turner, Frank Easterbrook, Richard Posner, and Robert Bork, were associated with either Harvard University or the University of Chicago. They applied microeconomic principles to antitrust questions and paid attention to empirical work, which led them to conclude that a lot of the pre-1970s antitrust case law was inconsistent with rational, pro-competitive, and economically beneficial behavior. By the time I left the agency for the first time in 1989, application of microeconomic principles and economic models was routine and encouraged. Notwithstanding some initial criticism, the Clinton administration's antitrust leadership, including Bob Potofsky, Ann Bingaman, and Joel Klein, largely adhered to these same principles. So when I returned to the commission as director of the Bureau of Competition in 2001, there was substantial support for and acceptance of the antitrust reforms that had been initiated 20 or so years prior. In other words, there was a general consensus on how we ought to think about antitrust enforcement and policy. But now, at the beginning of my third stint at the Commission, things have shifted. The broad antitrust consensus that has existed within the antitrust community in a relatively stable form for about 25 years is being challenged in at least two ways. First, some recent economic literature concludes that the U.S. economy has grown more concentrated and less competitive over the last 20 to 30 years, which happens to correlate with the timing of the change to a less enforcement-oriented antitrust policy beginning in the early 1980s. These concerns merit serious attention, and they will be part of today's discussion. Second, some are debating the very nature of antitrust itself, calling for antitrust enforcers to take account of policy goals beyond consumer welfare inequality, labor issues, excessive political power are perhaps the main examples. We will discuss some of these suggestions during later sessions. These concerns raise a challenge to antitrust agency leadership, the courts, and legislators to think hard about whether significant adjustments to antitrust doctrine, enforcement decisions, and law would be beneficial to our country in order to accommodate these concerns. <clears throat> As I noted in announcing the hearings, it is important that the antitrust enforcement agencies be at the forefront in thinking about these issues, not bystanders to this debate. To that end, today and continuing through the fall and the early winter, we have invited interested parties to discuss these issues, 
both through public comment and public sessions with us and each other. We do this with the goal of understanding whether our current enforcement and policies are on the right track or on the wrong track. And if they are on the wrong track, what should we do to improve them? I approach all of these issues with a very open mind, very much willing to be influenced by what I see and hear at these hearings. I am old enough to have witnessed in my own career dramatic changes in antitrust policy and enforcement. These changes have largely been driven by developments within the economic community, which were then adopted by the legal community. The movement by economists, however, has not always been in the same direction. In the 1950s and 60s, a substantial body of empirical economic work purported to show significant antitrust effects, uh, any competitive effects, at relatively low levels of concentration. In 1968, the DOJ issued merger guidelines based on these studies. But just about the time the guidelines were issued, the economic studies on which they were based were being substantially discredited. As a result, the agencies over time raised the concentration levels at which mergers were seen as problematic. A more recent example where developments in economics increased the level of successful merger enforcement involves hospitals. In the 1990s, the government lost a large number of hospital merger cases in a row, and the agencies considered whether to give up on hospital merger enforcement. Fortunately, we did not. Instead, we engaged in empirical economic studies that demonstrated the anti-competitive effects of hospital mergers, and we revitalized our hospital merger enforcement program. So the developments in economics can suggest, depending on the circumstances, that our enforcement has either been too aggressive or too lax. This episode involving hospital merger enforcement really drove this point home for me personally. The use of economics should not be thought of as a one-way ratchet, only driving down the level of antitrust enforcement. Good economics might, might point us toward more or less enforcement, depending on the facts and the analysis in front of us at the time. In my view, basing antitrust policy and enforcement decisions on an ideological viewpoint, whether from the left or from the right, is a mistake. Whether or not we expand antitrust beyond the consumer welfare standard, I would rather make policy and enforcement decisions based on the best evidence and analysis, including in particular empirically grounded economic analysis that enables the analyst to weigh the costs and benefits broadly defined to help determine the best approach. My hope is that these hearings will significantly improve our ability to do so and help to bring about a new and improved consensus among our antitrust stakeholders. But we are not focused solely on competition issues today or throughout the hearings. The strength and direction of the agency's consumer protection mission is also something that we are going to explore at some length at these hearings. Today, our most significant and difficult consumer protection issues often revolve around the use and abuse of technological capabilities not likely imagined during Bob Potofsky's chairmanship. As a result, we'll, we will be having multiple sessions on data security issues, and our upcoming hearings on platforms, big data, and artificial intelligence will address consumer protection issues, including privacy, as well as competition issues. Before closing, I want to thank not only the participants in these sessions, but the many groups and individuals who have filed comments in response to our initial hearings notice. We have received over 500 non-duplicative comments many of very substantial length and thoughtfulness. We are reading them and considering them carefully. We expect more comments as we proceed. And I encourage those interested to comment on what you hear today and throughout the hearings. I also want to thank our co-sponsor and host, the team at Georgetown University Law Center, for helping us pull this initial effort together. I also want to recognize the staff of the FTC for their efforts in both preparing for the substance of this event and undertaking all the logistics to bring this together. I and all the commissioners are grateful for the work of so many people, both within the FTC and outside the FTC, who are engaged in making this a successful effort. Thank you for attending, and I hope you enjoy the hearings. Turn it over to Bilal.
okay. So I'll just take a few minutes to introduce the panelists and then try to get out of the way um, in, no, in no particular order, or maybe some particular order. Uh, Jason Furman will speak first. Jason uh, is presently a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard University and was uh, formerly <coughs> the uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, Tim Yaris, just to Jason's left, uh, it was uh, most re uh, is presently a senior counsel at Sidley in Austin, but uh, was also chairman of the FTC from 2001 to 2004, and previously directors of both the Bureau of Competition and the Bureau of Consumer Protection, uh, but not, of course, at the same time. Um, uh, just uh, to the left of um, uh, Tim is Elisa Hutnick. She's a partner at Kelly Dry and uh, really an expert in consumer protection law. Um, uh, immediately to my left is um, Jim Rill. Uh, Jim is senior counsel at Baker Botts presently, uh, but was head of the antitrust division uh, from about 1989 to 1992. Uh, and then we also have uh, Jan McDavid, who was not uh, head of either agency, uh, but certainly is one who has been considered to head either, maybe even both agencies, uh, had uh, uh, in, in the past. Uh, uh, Jan is a partner at uh, Hogan Levels. And finally, but by no means least, uh, Professor Vladek, who uh, served as director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection uh, just a few short years ago, and of course is a professor here at uh, Georgetown. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and just remind everybody if they have questions, uh, raise your hand, pass your questions over to uh, some of my colleagues who are collecting uh, question cards. Uh, thank you um, so much. And, and I thought uh, Chairman Simon's remarks were perfect in three respects. Um, one is you want somebody to be open-minded coming to this question, because thinking really is evolving very rapidly. Um, second, he had a really excellent capsule history of um, antitrust and thinking. Um, and third, I think he made it clear that he was deferring completely to economists in how he was proceeding on this um, matter. Um, I'm a little bit of an interloper on this panel. I think I'm one of the only economists. And anyone that knows any economics would know I'm even more of an interloper um, than that, because my main focus has been on macroeconomic issues, labor market issues, inequality, um, not on industrial organization and antitrust um, narrowly defined. When I was chairing the Council of Economic Advisors, um, I came to this issue um, partly out of you know, what I'll now admit was paranoia. Um, there was a crime that had been committed, and we were looking for suspects. Um, the crime was low productivity growth and high inequality, something clearly going wrong in the economy, productivity growth being about a percentage point lower than it over the last decade than it had been um, previously. At the same time, high levels of inequality continued um, to move higher. And those were the two factors that were underlying um, the slowdown of the growth in income for the typical families that you know, I think is the central challenge for economic policy. So what can you do to raise productivity growth um, to reduce inequality? And we're looking around at a lot of different suspects. Um, and just to be clear, um, there is more than one cause of this set of phenomenon. But one thing we alighted on um, was this area. And part of what motivated it was a few sub-facts under those two big ones. Um, and let me just list a few of them. Um, one, a number of economists had documented that throughout the economy, there was less churn and dynamism. Fewer businesses being created, fewer uh, older businesses, larger businesses increasingly dominating the economy, fewer people moving from job to job. So, a little bit more of a sclerosis than we like to think is the case for the US economy. Um, there was, um, on terms of inequality, uh, sorry, a reduction in investment, um, a trend down in investment. Partly that's a shift to intangibles, but um, not completely, and trying to understand that. On the inequality side, there was a rise, a fall in the reduction, sorry, a fall in the share of income going to 
labor, and finally an increase in markups and a rise in the rate of return to capital relative to the safe rate of return and an increasingly skewed rate of return to capital with some very successful companies having persistently very high returns, much higher than the median, relative to the median um, than they had before. So this was a fact pattern about aggregate data that made us look beneath the aggregates in terms of what was going on at the firm and the industry level. Now, one way to look at what's going on in the firm and the industry level is to use um, aggregate, aggregate industrial data and to divide up the economy into you know, 10 industries, into 800 industries, and look within each one of those at what's going on in concentration. Um, and a, numbers did that. a no, number of people did that, Grion et al., um, Autor et al., we did at the Council of Economic Advisors, um, and you saw it in the press as well in places like The Economist. And we generally find that in about 75% of industries defined in this way, concentration um, increased. Now, you know, as the antitrust community was quick to point out, um, there's some dispute as to whether it was 35 years ago people realized this was an idiotic procedure, or 50 years ago that people realized this was an idiotic procedure, but that these are in antitrust markets. Now, the people that put this forward from the very beginning, including ourselves, understood that. No one would bring an antitrust case based on these types of aggregate data. Everything has um, you know, pluses and minuses, but we're trying to look at economy-wide phenomenon and really needed to use economy-wide data because the type of relevant antitrust market analysis we have for some parts of the economy, and I'll talk about it in a moment, but we don't have it for all of them and can't really aggregate up, synthesize, um, and add it all together. When looking at this macro data, I think the question is not ex ante, what do we think about it? Of course these aren't the relevant markets for antitrust. It's, does it work? Does it help explain some of what we're trying um, to explain? And subsequent research by Gutierrez and Philippon, among others, has found actually that at this aggregate level, increases in concentration are tied to reductions in business investment, are tied to reductions in R&D by business, and also are associated with um, rising markups in those industries and rising um, rates of profit in those industries. So you see it, these different measures seem to, in a broad sense, work um, and explain some of what we are interested in. The next set of measures that one could look at aren't the aggregate macro data, but are doing what you would do in an antitrust case, which is looking at a particular relevant market, properly defined, and asking, is the level of concentration high? Has the level of concentration um, increased? There have been a range of studies, some done by um, the FTC, a number done by economists, for a whole lot of markets, um, ad services, health insurers, hospitals, refrigerators, airlines, telecommunications, beer, all of which have consistently found very high levels of concentration and in many cases um, rising levels of concentration well in excess of the levels that would trigger um, a review if there was a merger under um, the merger guidelines. Moreover, um, a new strand of research, one that is still very new, I wouldn't um, necessarily go and make policy on it with certainty tomorrow, um, but one that so far is turning out to be empirically more convincing than frankly um, I would have expected on common ownership, finds that when you know, the same few companies own all of the airlines and own all of the banks, that that increases concentration above and beyond what you would measure if you thought that American Airlines, United Airlines, and Delta were three different companies um, when you realize they're all owned by the same companies. And you see that in a variety of data, um, including remarkably at sort of a root by root level in terms of um, the pricing. So there's a wealth of microeconomic, more traditional 
um, antitrust evidence for this. So the question now is, why have we seen um, this increase in concentration, and what are its consequences? Um, I don't think there's any single answer to the why question. Um, in some cases, the increase in concentration may be for good reasons and reflect increases in efficiency, increases in competition that weed out some of the less effective firms, globalization and the like. Um, this is an explanation that's been stressed by um, economists including um, David Auder et al. Um, that's a story that probably works pretty well in the retail sector where it wasn't that there were a few big mergers. Um, it wasn't that um, you know, there was some collusive common ownership, but you know, a company, Walmart, figured out how to have better supply chain management and grew, and then Amazon um, did the same online, and as a result, there's more concentration um, in that sector, and it reflects that increase in efficiency. Um, for a lot of the economy, though, the story is much less benign um, than that one, and it gets to, um, has its roots in what Chairman Simons described as a large change in the way we thought about antitrust. Um, Quokka has documented, for example, the FTC's oversight, challenge, you know, looking into mergers, um, used to look at you know, six to five, now would never look at something um, like that. So you have changes in um, antitrust enforcement. Some of it may be grounded in other parts of the economy. We should be looking also at things like regulations and rent seeking that allow companies to um, you know, create rules that benefit themselves at the expense of others, certainly in questions like intellectual property. And I think a lot of these competition issues are about antitrust, um, but they go more broadly. And then if you look at labor markets, you want to look at occupational licensing, something the FTC has been at the forefront of for a long time, um, land use restrictions, and a whole bunch of ways that reduce competition um, in the economy. So I think you have this combination of um, good reasons, um, bad reasons, um, and then you have some that are you know, ambiguous. If you look at something like the tech sector, You've seen a lot of innovation, but you also have platforms with network effects that lend themselves um, to scale that might say that it's efficient to have you know, a single producer at scale. It's also efficient to have a single you know, municipal water company, but that doesn't mean we would want to let it go off and charge whatever it wanted to charge. I'm not saying that we want to regulate um, technology the same way we regulate municipal water. It's much more um, complicated, and it's an issue that I'm currently looking at um, as head of an expert panel for the UK government um, reviewing digital um, competition, but trying to understand the combination of good reasons that you've seen companies grow with innovation and competition um, and bad. Want to um, talk about why we care about this. Um, traditionally in economics, this is just about prices, and it's about prices being higher. Um, I think that issue matters. You know, airline prices and cell phone bills are higher in the United States than they are in Europe because European competition enforcers have been more vigorous. They have more players in those industries than we do. So I think the price issue um, matters. The price issue may be a lot smaller than some of the others I talked about. One is innovation, what this does to the incentives for business investment, for R&D, for productivity growth. Um, there's a longstanding debate between a review of Arrow and Schumpeter and economics about the impact of competition on um, innovation. But there's a number of ways in which it could be um, deleterious. Um, and then finally, um, inequality. And there's been, at the same time that there's been this increased thinking about these types of macro issues in competition, there also has been um, in labor markets um, as well. And that's grounded in the observation that every employment relationship has a um, bit of monopoly power and a bit of rent that's being divided between the two because there's a cost of finding a new job and shifting a job. Um, and so market power matters a lot. 
If you have one hospital in town, it's a lot harder for a nurse to threaten to move to another hospital to get um, a pay raise. If you have two hospitals in town, it's much easier for the two of them to collude tacitly or even illegally to hold down um, the pay of nurses. Even in the fast food industry, um, there's evidence that anti-poaching and non-competes agreements have a deleterious impact on workers' bargaining power, help to hold down wages, and have been part of the reason that the labor share has um, been reduced. So, um, you know, in summary, I think this evidence is coming from a variety of different places and a variety of different perspectives. If you're trying to ask a question about the economy as a whole, you're not going to have one definitive data source or one definitive study um, that's going to answer that question. You have to take um, a collage of views. And I think that collage involves looking at the pattern of what we've seen um, in the data that I've talked about in terms of falling labor share, falling investment, um, rising markups. Looking at the in industry level and seeing whether those phenomenon are industry by industry tied to concentration, um, and they are. Looking in a deeper, more careful way where we can, and we can, we've done that in a lot of different industries. Um, and then no single story comes out of this, but on balance and on average, this does seem to add up to a reduction in competition, a reduction in dynamism, and one that I think that we need to be concerned about and think about what ways we need to update our policies to address if we want to have more investment, more dynamism, more productivity growth, less inequality, um, in addition, of course, to the traditional focus on lower prices for consumers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jason. And we're going to turn to Tim Uris now. Uh, I will note that although Jason is the only economist on this panel, we have, if I count correctly, five economists, 100 percent of the panel, on our uh, second panel in the afternoon. So uh, we are trying to balance just about every uh, thing uh, in these hearings. Well, thank you, Bilal. Uh, I I'm honored to, to be here once again following in the giant steps of my friend and predecessor, Robert Petoskey. We first met in 1976, but it was 1988, uh, working on the second Kirkpatrick Commission, that we realized we shared a vision for the FTC. Not that Bob and I always agreed, of course. Minutes after being sworn in as chair, I announced to a somewhat nervous reaction that there was indeed a new majority. I said, there was no longer a majority of New York Yankee fans on the commission. The FTC has enjoyed great success for decades, and I address a few topics here. First, what durable success means for an agency like the FTC. Then the vision that Bob and I shared that has led to the agency's success. Next, I consider recent challenges from two Ps, paternalism and consumer protection and populism and antitrust. Because both of these isms once dominated FTC work, particularly in the 1970s, I discuss history. I lived through the 70s, and the decade was disastrous for the FTC. Nostalgia, expressed explicitly in recent literature, is misplaced. I have no desire to relive those years, and neither should you. I'm submitting a longer paper with lots of footnotes, uh, like lawyers do. Uh, uh, and I'll make a lot of assertions uh, for which those footnotes provide support. But starting with success, it has to be built on something more ephemeral than headlines. A definition that is less ephemeral starts with recognition that an agency needs a clear understanding of and support for its core mission among its constituents. Second, this core must derive from a vision clearly shared, not just today, but enduring, enduring through electoral cycles. 
Over time, perhaps decades, stakeholders that judge favorably the core mission of successful agencies. Finally, a successful public institution needs a coherent strategy. The positive agenda must direct the institution at all levels, from the staff to the managers to agency leaders. Without a general stat strategy and positive agenda, an agency merely reacts. The FTC has such an agenda, the heart of which is to attack practices that harm consumers by hampering the competitive process and violating the basic rules of exchange. The FTC's success in large part reflects this shared vision. Take antitrust first. Until recently, antitrust reflected bipartisan cooperation. Disagreements existed in close cases, but there was widespread agreement that antitrust should protect consumers, that economic analysis should guide case selection, and that horizontal cases were central to enforcement. Regarding cases, Robert Bork once remarked that firms either make war on each other or they make peace. This framework reflects the consensus that the most harmful practices occur when firms stop competing vigorously, making peace to hurt consumers. Horizontal mergers with likely anti-competitive effects are one fertile area for firms to make peace. Firms also make peace through non-merger conduct. As with mergers, of course, collaboration is not itself sufficient to assess consumer welfare. Many collaborations are beneficial, and the peacemaking of most concern lacks offsetting efficiencies, what antitrust lawyers call naked horizontal agreements. The FTC has pioneered development of the law here, especially among professions, generic drugs, and the process to analyze collaboration. In rare instances, a single firm with market power can exclude competition to harm consumers. The 2001 Microsoft case, probably the most famous recent example, is an, it, those kind of cases are important to any antitrust program. A particularly fruitful category of troubling single firm conduct involves misleading the government. Misuse of courts and government agencies is effective way, this rent seeking, to stifle competition. Such strategies are not limited to single firms, of course. They're the cheap exclusion, which is a, a felicitous uh, phrase that the uh, people at the FTC have invented. Two antitrust immunities help protect this rent seeking, nor and state action. Some courts have broadly interpreted these immunities for and for decades, 40 years in fact, the FTC has sought to circumscribe both with three Supreme Court victories in state action. On NOR, the agency saved consumers billions of dollars at the gas pump in Unical and provided large benefits for, cons uh, for pharmaceutical consumers in Bristol-Myers Squibb, among many other successes. The vision for Consumer protection is identical to that uh, in, in antitrust. Uh, when competition alone cannot defer dishonesty, private legal rights help. There's government-developed common law. When the market forces are, in, are insufficient and common law is ineffective, there's a role for a public agency. And consumer protection and antitrust naturally complement each other. Under the FTC's positive agenda, robust competition uh, is the first and most important way to protect consumers. Uh, and the FTC's role is crucial, but it's a referee, not the star player. The foundation and core of consumer protection is the systematic attack on fraud begun in 1981. And the FTC uh, has continued to expand in each uh, administration the fraud program. The commission has long evaluated advertising by legitimate businesses. And in this century has expanded into uh, uh, privacy, 
uh, and uh, with, with many successes. Uh, the National Do Not Call Registry being one of the most popular government initiatives in history. Uh, but yesterday's success has become today's challenge uh, with robocalls clogging our phones. Uh, in terms of robocalls, the FTC has been aggressive and ingenious, but ultimately robocalls are like spam. Spam was ultimately the most effective way to deal with spam was when the ISPs developed tools uh, to be able to uh, screen out the majority of spam. And in the same way, robocalls, uh, uh, I think, will be best dealt with when those who deliver phone services and others develop the legal and technical tools to block unwanted calls. Now, I've written uh, and so, and with Howard Beals that uh, uh, we criticize the Obama FTC on occasion. Uh, but compared to the paternalism of the, FTC, of the CFPB, to which I turn next, the FTC has been a paragon of virtue. Let me turn to those two Ps and their contrary vision for the FTC. The first is a return of the paternalism of the 70s. The FTC of that era sought to become the second most powerful legislature. In one 15-month stretch, the FTC issued over a rule a month seeking to transform entire industries along the vision of the then very young uh, people in charge of the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Has proposed most of these rules were market supplanting with adverse consequences. There was an exchange in the 1972 National Commission of Consumer Finance, which is illustrative, and I'm not making this up. The, there was a debate about whether poor and middle class people should borrow money to buy color televisions. Uh, with with some people saying they shouldn't do it uh, because they didn't need such luxuries, uh, and other people defending their right to buy on credit color televisions. Uh, that, unfortunately, was, was illustrative. This paternalism has returned with a vengeance in the CFPB, and by this I mean the Obama CFPB. Uh, whatever one thinks about what's going on, the powers of the CFPB are there, uh, they haven't been touched. When, uh, when President Warren comes in in a few years, uh, if, if, if she or someone uh, likes her, uh, like her comes in, the incredible power of the CFPB, which is insulated from any effective control, uh, will still be there. Substantively, the CFPB has broad, undefined powers to regulate. It adds the word abuse to the more defined FTC terms of, of deceptive of un, and unfairness. And abuse is akin to the FTC use of unfairness in the 1970s. And like the FTC, uh, the CFPB, uh, like the FTC in those days, the CFPB prefers to use its discretion uh, uh, as opposed to a definition. Uh, you can look at the effects of the CFPB on consumer credit, and they've been significant. Uh, in the paper, uh, I discuss the qualified mortgage rule and the criticism of the Federal Reserve uh, on that rule in, in slowing the return of the housing market and the adverse effect, particularly uh, uh, on minorities. Now, those who defend the CFPB sometimes raise behavioral economics, uh, which is a recent challenge to the benefits of markets. In its extreme version, it's based on the idea that errors that, and people obviously sometimes make mistakes, but the idea is that those errors are systematically irrational. Uh, now, some people will tell you that normal economics assumes that consumers have perfect, perfect knowledge in our economic calculators. Well, I was schooled by those normal economists, and I learned about transaction costs and imperfect information uh, from those individuals. So I think that that parody of economics is simply uh, inaccurate. Moreover, there are numerous problems with using behavioral uh, uh, economics. For one thing, the behavioralists don't agree on which biases they talk about are, are relevant. For another thing, there is not 
uh, empirical evidence uh, to support what they want to do. Uh, for yet another problem is that consumers invest uh, in, in various ways uh, to improve uh, decision making. Now, I'm not saying there aren't important papers uh, and empirical work here to be done. I cite a, a, an example in the paper of the credit card market where people do choose accurately and are learning from their mistakes. There are lots of papers like that in the healthcare market, I mean in the credit market. In the healthcare market, on the other hand, Fiona Scott Morton has written a, a very good paper uh, where, where there are systematic, uh, uh, m there are systematic mistakes. Now, I believe that healthcare markets are different, but I would hope these hearings and the FTC uh, pay attention uh, to those empirical issues. Uh, the second P, populism, is reflected in calls, and Chairman Simon mentioned this, on the left and the right, to use antitrust to dismantle the highly successful companies, or at least the so-called tech companies, or at least regulate them as public utilities. These are, dis are, are misguided calls. For one thing, what a tech or digital company is is hard to know. We have new technologies, but they're being diffused through the economy. Moreover, these companies have different positions in the market. Some have big market shares, some don't. Equally important, we've been down the populist road before with disastrous consequences. John Nectarlein and I discussed some of this history in a new paper that John will discuss in detail later, and let me talk about the highlights. Before Walmart and Amazon, another company used the same kind of tools uh, to become <coughs> the largest retailer <coughs> in the United States uh, for over 40 years. This company was so important, the company was the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, uh, that uh, John Updike, the young John Updike, used the company as the, the title and the setting for his iconic short story, which every one of my generation had to read in high school. Uh, and the, what happened was A&P uh, success triggered a backlash and the government went after A&P for two decades. First, they passed the Robinson-Patman Act, which embarrassed the antitrust world for much longer than two decades and took a long time for the antitrust world from which to recover. This new legislation was not enough. First, the government prosecuted the ANP successfully criminally. They still weren't done. They sued to break the ANP up. Uh, finally, uh, a new administration came in, the Eisenhower administration, and settled uh, for some uh, vertical uh, divestiture. Uh, the problem was this long war of attrition caused the leadership of ANP to focus on fighting the government, not on its new competition. And today, all that's left of the ANP are the are the coffees. Uh, eight o'clock, I think it's called eight o'clock. Uh, and the company itself uh, uh, is gone. Now, it's true that the FTC largely abandoned RP in the 70s, but there are two vestiges of populism that were strong at the FTC in the 70s, and the first was predatory pricing. There were three important cases, probably the most prominent of which was the coffee case. In the, in the, the mid-70s, Procter & Gamble, then the most feared marketer of consumer goods, had Folgers Coffee. Folgers Coffee expanded into the heartland, into the east, into the heartland of, of Maxwell House. Maxwell House General Foods responded, massive price war benefiting consumers enormously. How did the FTC respond? It sued General Foods for responding against the, the best marketer in the world. Uh, I'm not making that up either. Uh, and, there were, and there were other such cases, and a call for return to predatory pricing is an important plank of the new populist agenda. Another bulwark of the 70s antitrust was reliance on the simple market concentration doctrine. And the concentration levels were levels that no one today would regard as significant. The prominent example was four, four firms with 50% share. Uh, this theory was sometimes married to a populist animus toward bigness, 
which led the commission to seek vertical disintegration of the then very unconcentrated oil industry. Uh, and through 1980, the FTC was pursuing deconcentration long after the majority of the economics profession had dominated or had abandoned extreme versions of the market concentration doctrine. Well, let me conclude. With the creation of the CFPB, the FTC has another federal agency performing each mission. The original CFPB model, mirroring the 1970s FTC, contrasts to the modern FTC. Perhaps the regulatory world runs in cycles, but one hopes that the FTC will not be in a future Groundhog Day where it awakes each morning to 1975. In contrast, consider the current reform, in antitrust, I'm sorry, consider the impact of the current reformers who wish to return antitrust to focus less on consumers and more on protecting less efficient businesses. Imagine how the companies they would now punish would have fared in their desired legal environment. Once the newcomers had grown beyond a certain size, perhaps by the late 1990s, their lawyers would have counseled them to be cautious about expansion, innovation, and price cutting, lest they face antitrust liability for disadvantaging their less efficient rivals. Luckily, because this advice would have badly misstated antitrust law, lawyers did not give it. Let us pray for the sake of American consumers that such advice never becomes sound. Rather than condemn innovation, whether in the 1930s or today, we should applaud. Companies like the so-called tech giants have been built from the ground up in the United States rather than in Europe or China, largely because the US legal environment is stable, predictable, and uniquely hospitable to vigorous paradigm-shattering competition by all businesses. That legal environment is a hallmark of American exceptionalism. Long may it continue. Thank you. OK, thank you, Tim. And we'll turn to uh, Jim Rill now. Thank you, Bilal. It's uh, indeed an honor to be here in uh, commemoration of uh, the work that was done by Bob Potofsky and uh, leadership of the commission in 1995. Uh, and a particular honor to me, I go back uh, in relationships with Bob to 1969, when he was basically the author of the first Kirkpatrick report on the uh, Federal Trade Commission. And we worked together on the ABA. And uh, in 1992, he was a very important and direct consultant on the uh, 1992 horizontal merger guidelines. Um, so it's indeed an honor to be a participant in these, uh, in these programs. <clears throat> I want to talk today about the uh, developments in the antitrust world that's created by the globalization of antitrust, which I think is one of the most significant developments in the competition world in the uh, last decade since, uh, since the first Potofsky hearings. I think the most important thing we can see is there's been a cascade, a tsunami, of antitrust agencies across the world. In uh, 1995, there was a handful of agencies that had antitrust, and some agencies that had an antitrust law, Japan, uh, a gift of 1946, uh, really didn't enforce it. Now we see something like 130 or more agencies with an antitrust regime. And those agencies that have had an antitrust regime are increasingly engaged in enforcement, often with very controversial, very controversial results. So what we need to think about, and what I think needs to be thought about at the commission and the other antitrust agencies, is what is the response of the antitrust agencies to this global tsunami of antitrust agencies around the world. And I don't want to suggest that that's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing, uh, properly founded, properly principled, 
properly directed. Because I think a sound competition policy is essential to the operation of a market economy. So what have the what have the agencies done and what is the challenge facing them in the future? Um, the agencies were responsible. I think uh, particularly by the FTC and the Department of Justice in the formation of the International Competition Network in 19, uh, 19 uh, in 2001, following on the report of the Department of Justice International Competition Policy Advisory Committee, the ICEPAC, uh, that was put together in 1997 and uh, reissued its report in 2000. The International Competition Network was founded uh, on the uh, platform of the uh, uh, Fordham Program in 1991 with uh, uh, 12 members. Uh, Tim Muris was very instrumental in putting that together. Now we have well over 100 members, 100 agencies that are members of the International Competition Network. And the ICN has been extremely important in producing guidance uh, that's based on market economics and due process for its member countries and uh, for other countries around the world. Essentially soft guidance, but nonetheless effective and responsible guidance. Uh, the ICN has produced merger uh, notification and procedure guidelines, has put out uh, uh, through its unilateral conduct working group a guidelines on predatory pricing, guidelines on dominance. Um, most interestingly, I think, the uh, work that the uh, ICN has done in the area of procedural due process. And the uh, antitrust, uh, the, uh, the uh, working group, excuse me, the working group on agency effectiveness, which was headed, uh, task force headed by the Federal Trade Commission, the work of uh, Randy Tritell and Paul O'Brien has been extremely effective in putting out guidelines uh, on, on due process guiding principles, noted, uh, uh, annotated guidance, and similar documents. These are, <clears throat> these are extremely important contributions that are made towards uh, convergence, if not harmonization, in the, uh, in the antitrust world. Uh, similarly, the OECD, uh, again, under U.S. leadership, has put out uh, uh, a protocol on hardcore, uh, hardcore competition. Um, also, documents on uh, merger notification and procedure. <clears throat> uh, really uh, anticipating ahead of time the ICN's work in that area. Um, the uh, OECD has also issued a, a very monumental report on, uh, under the leadership of uh, then Chairman, uh, then Assistant Attorney General Varney, on, uh, on due process and uh, procedural fairness. Um, so most recently in uh, 2017, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission issued revised uh, guidance for international enforcement. Um, these guidance, uh, this guidance document, I think, broke some new ground in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, providing for uh, the government's involvement in advocacy uh, across uh, across the globe, that it would attempt to foment uh, uh, adherence to sound principles of not only process but substance, and would uh, and would advocate uh, and advocate positions as the occasion arose in particular situations. Um, it extolled the benefit of bilateral agreements which the United States uh, antitrust agencies have several, calling for cooperation in particular cases. It set forth principles of comedy. 
and established a principle that uh, criticized extraterritorial reach of antitrust enforcement where that extraterritorial reach was not based on immediate impact, substantial, reasonably foreseeable, direct immediate impact on the host nation, consistent with our, uh, with our, law, with our legal principles in that particular area. Um, on the question of its advocacy, what we have is a fairly general statement, however, not one that gets into the specificity of when and how that advocacy might be best advanced and effected and implemented. And I think that's a challenge, as we'll indicate, going ahead. The ICN, the International Competition Network, <clears throat> is uh, continuing its effort towards promoting convergence in substance and procedure uh, through workshops and similar efforts to bring about, uh, bring about convergence in harmonization and sound principles. Non-governmental agencies as well, since the last time of the, since the 1995 uh, hearings, increased their efforts. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has issued an ex so-called expert report. I say so-called because I was on it, so therefore I got to be modest. Um, uh, expert report on uh, due process and the way forward. Somewhat controversial in that it advocated the establishment of a uh, cabinet level coordinating committee for dealing with international antitrust. I think one, uh, an issue that uh, I personally have some, although I was on the report, I have some skepticism as to its efficacy, although there should be more coordination among the agencies of the federal government. Um, the American Bar Association has had several task forces, several reports in this area, a due process report, and currently a program going forward soon to be, I think, uh, finalized uh, on a sort of a, if you will, not, not, a, not a report card, but a, but a analysis of the implementation of due process uh, task force uh, headed by my partner, uh, John Talladay and Melanie Aiken. Um, also, the, uh, the ABA has presented, soon to present a paper on the use of public policy issues in antitrust globally. That is the extent to which non-antitrust factors flying under the flag of antitrust tend to adulterate, that's my pejorative, not theirs, I expect, tend to adulterate the, uh, the, the efficacy and substantial foundation for antitrust enforcement. Uh, the ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, has issued a report in this area that is of uh, significance and extols again the need for global consensus of fair procedures. Uh, so the, the private sector is active. Is it enough active? No, but increasingly active in this particular area. So what are the challenges going forward? There are limits, I think, to the efficacy of soft guidance, of soft convergence. It's necessary, essential, but is it, but is it enough? Is it sufficient? Uh, my answer to that is I think you need to go beyond it. There are uh, there's no structured mechanism right now for establishing, if you will, ambassadors for evaluating <clears throat> the extent to which the guidance of the various international organizations and national organizations that I've referenced are being actually implemented and, 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 and followed in the nations uh, around the world, including sometimes, I might say, the United States. Um, we see uh, actions in China involving a merger by Coca-Cola, which uh, I think has questionable economic foundation, a denial 
of a transaction involving NXP, which had been approved by every other agency in the world, on grounds that are difficult to discern any kind of link to, 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 to sound antitrust. We see in Korea an expanded reach for extraterritoriality in an area where there may be no effect whatever on consumer welfare in Korea. We see in Taiwan enforcement actions with no printed, published, and maybe not even any practiced sound standards for due process. Um, all of these issues, I think, are a challenge, a huge challenge to global antitrust, including the United States, uh, going forward. And sometimes, frankly, the United States has been criticized for its use of CFIUS, uh, criticized overseas by its use of CFIUS to, uh, in fact, undermine uh, sound antitrust analysis and, uh, and engage in national championship work. I'm not sure I agree. I don't agree with that in many respects, but I know it has been criticized overseas and recently <clears throat> in a speech. Uh, former uh, Director General, uh, former Commissioner for Competition of the European Union, Mario Monti, said that uh, Europe has much sounder antitrust leadership, foundation, correctness than the United States. Um, we, have to, we, we have to be aware of that and be, and be sensitive to it. So what, what should be the response going forward? Um, and I don't pretend to have any particular wisdom here, but throw out some ideas and, and actions that I've, that I've seen. Uh, first, there is an increasing, uh, I think, demand, interest for the United States agencies to become directly involved in individual enforcement actions overseas, where the effect is on important interest to the United States, not to protect the U.S. champion, but where there's an important interest to the United States that bears on effective competition policy. Uh, we have in our, in our agreements uh, and in, uh, in other uh, international principles, mechanisms for cooperation, notification, and transparency. These, these, I suggest, should be implemented. They have been implemented by the United States uh, in Boeing, McDonnell, Douglas, for example, um, the U.S. was very much involved in attempting to, I think, put on the say, put on the right track. The European Commission's analysis of that transaction, even to the point where this guy was an antitrust professor at Arkansas, I think, named William Clinton, got involved in uh, lobbying before the European Commission uh, on that transaction. Um, the actions of the Federal Trade Commission in certain circumstances have been salutary. I think in discussing a matter involving Intel in Japan, there was an effective outcome. Uh, press reports indicate there was an effective outcome involved in U.S. involvement with uh, Qualcomm, a principal issue in China. And of course, the uh, I'm not sure how effective, well, I think effective because I think it brought about greater con uh, convergence and understanding and consultation. The U.S. criticism of the European in a, uh, Commission's action in GE Honeywell. Uh, we must respect foreign agencies' interpretation of their own law. Uh, we don't necessarily need to uh, surrender to it in our uh, efforts to converge, to consult. I think the decision by uh, my classmate, <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in the vitamin C case, sets a good principle for our, the question of respect, but not total deference to foreign law. So I think what we need to do forward, going forward, what I suggest would be an appropriate role for the Tri Federal Trade Commission is to consider the really excellent work it's done and the recent work that the Department of Justice has done, I think the Federal Trade Commission, under the guidance of Randy Tritel, has done, made great strides in this area. But the question is testing the implementation. And I'd like to close with reference to the initiative that's recently been announced 
and promoted by Assistant Attorney General Megan Del Rahim to establish a multilateral framework for procedure and antitrust cases. Uh, he recently spoke at the Fordham Conference, indicating that there's significant progress in that area, that some 12 or so countries are signing on. We haven't seen what they're signing on to in detail yet, but signing on to the principle, I think it's the major first step by, an international, by a national uh, antitrust agency to attempt to persuade other countries that there needs to be some system, joint system, for assisting in the implementation and review, uh, not a scorecard, but a review of the extent to which the guidance documents, the so-called soft guidance, is actually adopted and fomented in the international arena. I think that is the challenge going forward to the FTC, to the Department of Justice, uh, and I think it's a challenge of enormous importance for international antitrust and international competition policy. And so with that, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jim. Alisa, uh, your convenience, and I note that um, I'm very envious of the uh, ice pack that they had apparently three to four years to do their report. <laughs> it has legs. So switching gears to consumer protection and privacy, um, and like most consumer protection lawyers, I have pictures. So I do want to first uh, strongly support the Commission's objectives for these hearings. Um, I'm a firm believer in that there is value in self-examination and being willing to both solicit and consider constructive feedback from constituents and practitioners inside and out. And indeed, from a similar process, the 1995 hearings positively shaped subsequent FTC policy and approach, and one would expect similar outcomes from these hearings. So taking the time machine, let's see if we can get there. Um, back to the 90s, and while some of us might have had Mariah Carey on the radio, hopefully nobody's going to raise their hands on that. Um, here at the FTC, the 1995 hearings had technology front and center in the focus. And there, the focus was innovative changes and convergence happening with the online marketplace, television, cyberspace even radical new technology issues such as purchasing compact discs over your telephone. And notably, even then, the FTC was already anticipating issues with the amount and the type of data collected online. Who was accessing that data? How many people were accessing that data? Cybersecurity issues with the data and the associated other consumer protection considerations. The resulting Potofsky report from those hearings provided an effective roadmap for consumer protection business guidance and policy for over 20 years. Tim Uris mentioned durability. This policy has been extremely durable. That report centered on several key tenets. One, consumer sovereignty. This is a point that's been echoed in the 1980 FTC policy on unfairness and in decades before in adjudications and business guidance. The idea that we would give consumers access to material information and allow them to make their own choice without regulatory intervention, to do it conveniently. Two, the agency would prioritize enforcement to fight fraud and deception and unfair business practices that caused consumers harm. The agency also would support industry self-regulation as a way to make limited agency resources go further and to provide businesses with greater clarity on compliance expectations. And finally, the Commission would provide consumer education to empower consumers to navigate through emerging marketplaces. And while some might argue that the application of these concepts has ebbed and flowed over the years, they're viewed by many as the successful foundation to the FTC's approach in consumer protection. And it's an approach that is largely consensus-based it's not largely political, it's measured, and it intentionally considers competition concerns with those of consumer protection. It's also a framework that supports our nation of innovation. We are experiencing and witnessing a, rev a technology revolution that has no end in sight, and a robust marketplace that provides feedback when a line has been crossed, 
through both consumer choice, a vibrant press, and government enforcement. And while there may be growing pains from time to time, and sometimes criticisms that the FTC does not act fast enough to prevent unlawful business conduct, it is the flexible nature of the FTC's Section 5 authority that is such a critical part of our country's economic success. But like any balanced framework, we should continue to ask tough questions to determine if and what changes may be warranted so that the agency's consumer protection mission can continue to be fulfilled for the next 20 years. And in looking at the comments filed in response to these hearings, they certainly raise several themes. One of the main themes that Chairman Simon started out, started out with was the concept of technology. Whether the technology marketplace of today and tomorrow requires a change to the FTC's organizational structure and allocation of resources. And just as the 1996 Petofsky report following those hearings observed that there would be challenges to the agency's consumer protection mission with the evolving technology marketplace, today's cyber threats and technology changes and innovations will absolutely test the FTC's expertise and its resources. Technology plays an integral part of the consumer experience, whether at work, at home, in educational settings, healthcare, facilitates the way we interact with each other and with the world around us. So it's no surprise then that technology should play such a key role in most of the FTC's consumer protection enforcement cases. And given the technology emphasis of commerce today and tomorrow, does the current FTC's organizational structure and investment of resources and technology expertise reflect the present foreseeable needs in order to fulfill the consumer protection mission. One of the second themes, and many might call it a pain point, reflected in the comments is the ever-growing patchwork of consumer, prote consumer protection and privacy laws around the globe and here in the United States. The 1996 Petofsky Report recognized the obstacles that a multitude of conflicting laws would pose for commerce, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses and new entrants. Today, these compliance obstacles have only grown, particularly in the area of privacy, where there appears to be a race to become the most comprehensive in regulating data practices. And given the examples that we are seeing in Europe, California, and elsewhere, it remains an open question on whether the Commission's risk-based approach will have to yield to a national and uniform approach to privacy. But that may be easier said than done with respect to passing federal legislation, particularly in an election year. So in the near term and in the absence of a uniform federal standard, what type of guidance and policy leadership can the agency provide that could be helpful to the national and global discussion on the costs and the benefits of more prescriptively regulating business practices. And the third theme from the comments underscored a, a point that this agency has always faced. Where to focus its enforcement efforts? What shall be the priorities given finite and limited resources? And with lots of shiny objects and headlines to choose from, the agency has most advanced its consumer protection mission when it is focused on business practices causing real harm. Financial and physical harm have rightly had the agency's attention, but importantly, given the role of technology in our lives, the agency, under then acting Chairman Olhausen, has also explored how informational injury can cause real harm, and how the agency can measure such harm and seek to deter and to remedy unlawful business practices with such results. Doing more with less also might involve all aspects of the Commission's in-house expertise, with more visible collaboration with the bureaus of competition and economics. Indeed, the unfairness prong of Section 5 requires that competition be taken into account, and more transparency on this involvement in the competition analysis and consumer protection cases would provide helpful guidance to businesses, which in turn will help consumers. The last theme that was raised and that I'll touch on by the comments, and which played an important role in the Petofsky Report as well, is how important the FTC supporting and incentivizing company participation in meaningful self-regulatory programs is. They're not a substitute for government oversight, but they can enhance the agency's consumer protection mission with a lot less cost. History has shown that self-regulation is more nimble 
and able to move more quickly to address innovation and technology changes. And when the FTC promotes the use of self-regulation and incentivizes companies to embrace such standards, industry responds time and time again. And consumers benefit directly from this carrot rather than stick approach, incentivizing rather than purely focusing on punitive deterrence. So I will keep my, my comments shorter. Um, leads me to concluding remarks that with the rapid changes that were happening and all the discussion around technology, we're largely discussing many of the same types of issues that were discussed in some form at the last set of hearings in 1995. And as we hear from many voices during these hearings, I can say from my personal experience, working with startups, working with large companies, new entrants, those that have been around for decades, most companies are motivated to do the right thing while also remaining competitively viable. Straightforward laws that do not pick winners or losers, clear regulatory guidance, and vigorous support of self-regulation enables companies to achieve those goals without unnecessarily fencing in opportunity or innovation. And for the fraudsters and companies that are bent on causing consumer harm, the FTC has its tools, existing tools, to address that. Thank you. Okay, well, Elisa, thank you. We're gonna, and, and thank you for getting us uh, almost back on schedule. As, um, as, my, as my friends know, um, being off schedule just a few minutes would be a major achievement in my, in my uh, life. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> we're gonna take about a 10 minute break, so let's come back here just a little slightly after um, 10.30, and we'll start up again.
Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we do have uh, some of my FTC colleagues collecting uh, question cards. So if you have a question for the um, uh, panel members, just uh, write it on the card, raise your hand, we'll pick it up, and uh, we, will, we will try to get to it. Um, but before we turn to both sort of the panel Q&A and audience Q&A, uh, we're going to ask uh, uh, separately both Jan McDavid and uh, David Vladek to uh, both comment on what they've heard and honestly uh, comment on whatever they'd like to comment on. Um, but, uh, but I'm sure it'll be germane. So I'll first turn it over to Jan, and then I'll turn it over to David when Jan is complete. Thank you, Bilal. I want to applaud the Federal Trade Commission for again using its statutory authority to consider whether changes in our economy require adjustments in the FTC's enforcement priorities. Such hearings were part of the FTC's original statutory mandate and have been used very effectively throughout its history, most notably in the Petofsky hearings that were discussed extensively this morning. I'm honored to participate again, as I did in the Petofsky hearings, and I'm returning to my antitrust roots here at Georgetown because my antitrust career started my final semester in law school at Georgetown when I studied antitrust law with Bob Petofsky. Hearings provide the FTC an opportunity to step back and consider broad philosophical issues without the pressure of facts and time deadlines arising out of particular proceedings. That's a real luxury that most agencies don't have and the FTC does. That kind of introspection allows the FTC to identify opportunities for improvement. It also offers an opportunity for democratic participation which is one of the objectives recently outlined by Commissioner Chopra in his, part, in his paper last week. I speak here as a practitioner who advises clients every day on antitrust issues. And I share the FTC's view that competition produces the best, most innovative, lowest priced products and services for consumers. Most antitrust enforcement actually takes place in conference rooms in law firms and boardrooms in corporations where people like me advise our clients on where the lines are and how they can achieve their business objectives without crossing those lines. Our ability to do that effectively is significantly enhanced if our clients know that the antitrust cop is on the beat. That was true in the Bush, Clinton, and Obama administrations because antitrust has always enjoyed bipartisan support. And based on early impressions, it's also true with the current Federal Trade Commission and antitrust division. I've always viewed the antitrust laws as sufficiently flexible to adapt to changing market conditions, such as those involving the growth of technologies or foreign competitors. It also has been a sufficiently flexible to be applied across a broad range of industries involving defense, healthcare, consumer goods, or technologies, which don't particularly have anything in common. The antitrust statutes, as they've been interpreted by the agencies and the courts in recent years, in the last 30 years or so, provide a framework that knowledgeable counsel can apply as we consider the unique facts brought to us by our clients. And of course, we also bring to bear the economic concepts that are so important to underlying antitrust analysis today. Over the course of my career, I've seen the development of sound antitrust doctrine rooted in a principled analysis and above all, the positive role that economic analysis played starting really with the Supreme Court's decision in general dynamics, which was decided just before my final law school exam by Bob, and the GTE Sylvania decisions, and leading to various iterations, for example, of the merger guidelines. In contrast, one of my mentors, former FTC Commissioner Tom Leary, said that during his early career, when they would be defending a merger before the agents, they would say, God forbid it would achieve any efficiencies, because that was suspect in the 60s and early 70s. 
as I was trying to do economic, uh, antitrust research as a young lawyer and as a law student, I had a very hard time discerning any consistent thread through the cases I was reading. And that made it really hard to advise clients. That's not true anymore because we have a framework that lawyers and I, even our clients understand. During my career, antitrust analysis has been grounded in fundamental principles and focused on consumer welfare. Contrary to the concerns expressed by some, prices are not the only touch point in our analysis. We have handled many matters in which issues like innovation and product quality were much more central than price. And in my experience, the agencies have done a very good job of identifying those, those issues and resolving them in the matters. The way they have done so has also made it possible for advisors like me to tell our clients where the antitrust lines are. I'm a progressive Democrat, so you might expect that I would be applauding the development of populist antitrust theories. But I think that including populist antitrust concepts would make the task that I undertake for my clients much more difficult. Instead of well-established principles grounded in consumer welfare and sound economic analysis, we would be applying amorphous concepts of bigness and fairness, some of which turn traditional principles on their heads, such as lower prices that don't have the, the underpinnings of a predatory pricing analysis, or penalizing large successful technology companies simply for being successful because they created new products and services that consumers genuinely desired. This could return us to the era of Vaughn's Grocery, where the dissent lamented, quote, the court grounds its conclusion solely on the impressionistic assertion that the Los Angeles retail food industry is becoming concentrated because the number of single store concerns has declined. This led Justice Stewart to complain that the sole consistency I can find in the antitrust laws is that the government always wins. But even that wouldn't be true in a populist system because ultimately we don't have an administrative system in the United States. We have a system of enforcement and the agencies and private plaintiffs bear the burden of proof. In Europe and many other countries, the government can simply say no. Here, they have to go to court and they do so grounded in facts and economic analysis that supports their case but with a framework that everyone understands. Where there are legitimate concerns about fairness or employment effects, for example, those issues should be addressed under different regimes, as is done today with the CFIUS, unless, as in the case, for example, of the no poach cases, there is a legitimate antitrust concern directly affecting employment and arising out of particular conduct. Antitrust is a well-calibrated tool to achieve competition and consumer welfare, but it is poorly designed to tackle social issues that are more appropriately addressed under other kinds of legislation. We should respect the limitations of antitrust. And finally, antitrust analysis that includes amorphous concepts of bigness and fairness could lend itself to politically motivated enforcement, which we certainly should eschew, especially now in the current political environment. Thank you. Uh, David, we'll, we'll turn to David then. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, let me start by thanking Chairman Simon for holding these hearings. I think this is the right way for the commission, for a new commission to get its bearings and to figure out what its, what its priorities are going to be and what its agenda should be. I also think it's right to honor Bob Petoskey. Uh, his legacy still looms large at the FTC. It did when I was there. I'm sure it still does. Uh, the influence he's had, not simply on the antitrust side of the agency, but on the consumer uh, protection side. Uh, is enormous, um, and it's only fitting to do this here at Georgetown Law School. 
So I generally agree with Alyssa, and I'm, I'm tr going to try not to repeat the, the points that she made. What I'd like to talk about are what I think are three main challenges the Commission faces going forward. And the first, and this, this I think Alyssa brought up, is tech, tech, tech. Um, virtually everything the agency does today has some connection with emerging technologies. When uh, Chairman Leibowitz and I got to the FTC, we did not have a tech infrastructure. We did not have a single technician on staff to the extent we needed to engage in, in forensic analysis. We had to outsource it. Today, uh, because each of the successive chairs has built upon the tech infrastructure that we started uh, to build, uh, the agency has more technology capacity than ever, but I still wonder whether it's sufficient. Um, the agency needs deep expertise in things like artificial intelligence. It needs the forensic ability to conduct investigations and data breaches and in other kinds of consumer injuries. Uh, we need better forensics, better tools. And so one challenge I think the agency faces going forward is to make sure that its infrastructure, its, its resources match the challenges that the agency faces. Um, so I think that's one. Uh, 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 one of my former colleagues, uh, Kratmaker, Professor Kratmaker, suggested that maybe it was time that the FTC added a new bureau, a Bureau of Technology. I don't know whether that's the, the right way to address the technology deficits that the FTC faces, but that's something that ought to be considered. <clears throat> Second, the challenges of protecting consumers in a digital economy. Now, the FTC in 2012 issued a report that tries to set out a framework about how consumer protection matches the FTC mandate. And I think there's a lot of very valuable advice in that report. I would urge the new, uh, the new commissioners to dust it off and take a look. Because it provides, I think, a blueprint, at least, for dealing with some of the difficult questions the, the commission's going to face. For example, automated decision making. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily a foe of artificial intelligence. After all, we all know that human decision making, eh, it's not necessarily great, right? <clears throat> but it provides all sorts of challenges for regulators. Uh, it's a black box system. You can interrogate an, an algorithm. Um, and it, it can be a greeting ground for disparate treatment that is based on impermissible factors. And rooting out those kinds of problems is very difficult for the agency. Um, Data-driven offers and pricing. Uh, the marketplace is full of variable pricing uh, and variable offers. I mean, there have been challenges about Facebook's ads for housing and so forth. These are very difficult challenges the agency faces to ensure fairness in the marketplace. Um, and the lack of transparency in the algorithmic decision-making process runs a real risk that at least some consumers are going to face tyranny by algorithm. The, the commission needs to figure out how it can be an effective regulator in this space. Uh, it, it faces enforcement challenges. Uh, yesterday, there was a New York Times article about <clears throat> the New Mexico Attorney General bringing a COPPA case and criticizing the FTC for not beating his office to the punch. <clears throat> well, COPPA enforcement has been a, a thorn on the side of the agency since apps were developed. The app market, you know, the app developer market is highly diffuse. There are thousands of people many, you know, making apps, some in their parents' basement. Um, and it's very hard, unless you're going to carpet bomb the industry, to have a, an enforcement regime that really works well. And now the agency has brought many, many COPPA cases and has done so against high profile, high profile, <coughs> high profile violators. But that's a problem. And, you know, Alyssa talked about the usefulness of self-regulation. This is an area where we've encouraged self-regulation. We actually detailed a lawyer <coughs> to work out of our San Francisco office to be an outreach person to the app development community or encouraging some kind of self-regulatory body. Uh, we didn't succeed. 
So there, there are some enforcement challenges that the agency faces as well that are magnified by outdated statutes that the agency has to enforce. Neither FICRA nor Graham Leach Bliley nor some of the other statutes <clears throat> that were enacted before anyone could envision a digital economy like this uh, need to be updated. And I would hope that, that the commission can work with Congress uh, to do so. I think the lack of civil penalties in Section 5 cases has been a, a serious uh, lack for the agency, particularly in data breach cases. Uh, the RAND Institute has done a number of studies making clear that the economic incentives, particularly for box stores and other kinds of consumer-facing companies, don't push hard enough to ensure robust uh, security defenses. That is, it's, it's economically rational uh, to, uh, to risk a data breach because the cost of strengthening one's defenses may outweigh it. Um, I think a, a civil penalty availability in those kinds of cases would add a necessary deterrent um, and might help stem the tide of rampant ID theft. Um, I think we need to update the unfairness doctrine. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting because the unfairness doctrine face, seems to at least be interpreted by some to require some form of economic or economic-like harm. But the statutory mandate of the FTC is to prevent unfair and deceptive practices, not try to remediate them when they take place. And there are many harms that are just not actually well remediated by money. I mean, for example, the Ashley Madison data breach. Uh, you know, this was a secret dating site. Um, well, marriages broke up, people committed suicide. This, these are serious harms that ought to be prevented. There is at least an argument that the unfairness uh, statement as it's currently constituted doesn't really take into account some of these reputational injuries that have been you know, made possible by a digital economy. Uh, my last point is the regulation of big data. Uh, there's now pervasive data collection. It's ubiquitous. In fact, the last bastion of privacy, our homes, is now yet another site of data collection. People have always on, always off devices. Uh, the Internet of Things are going to put sensors in people's homes. All of this, you know, is, they, they serve useful purposes, but they involve enormous data collection. And we need to figure out how to protect consumers in this area of ubiquitous data collection. Uh, we don't have laws that really deal with this. Uh, the aggregation of data is, uh, is a real uh, sort of enticement to data thieves. Um, so, the, you know, uh, Paul Ohm, who worked at the FTC when, when John and I were there, uh, wrote an, a law review article about 10 years ago where he forecast there might become a time where there would be databases of ruin. That is, that the data collection would be so ubiquitous that whatever fact that you would be mortified to have revealed to the public or to other people, um, that those facts will be in a database. Well, given the ability of, you know, of data sharing, data lakes, the ubiquitous movement of data, uh, there really is no answer to those questions now. And those are questions that the FTC has to address. We, we did, when I was at the FTC, we did a 6B on, you know, the data collection by data brokers. Um, and I think that was a good start. And I think one of the things I would urge the commission to think about is using its 6B authority to get a better handle on basically just how consumer data flows. Where does it go? Who has access to it? What kinds of constraints, if any, ought to be imposed? So I think the, I, I, I commend the FTC for holding these hearings. I think this is going to be a challenging but interesting time. Um, and I urge that the commission think about these things. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you, David. What, uh, what I'd like to do now is, uh, you know, I, I have a series of questions, and in uh, frankness, we've, we've shared them with the group uh, in advance. 
but of course they were prepared uh, before I knew what anybody would say. Uh, what I'd like to do is first ask the panelists maybe to ask questions of each other or comment on what, what others have said. Um, and, uh, and because he has to leave uh, at 11.30 um, uh, and in fact uh, squeeze this in uh, to do this panel, um, I'd, I'd like to ask Jason if he's got some uh, thoughts on what he's heard, particularly because he comes from this uh, from a different perspective or different background than, than the rest of us. And then I'll ask folks maybe to put some questions to Jason. Um, yeah, well, I guess I've, we've heard two references to populist antitrust, and I'm not <coughs> sure whether I agree or disagree with those comments. Um, if those comments are saying you should replace the current disciplined approach with a sort of woolly headed, if you don't like the company and you want to promote democracy and like ground your approach in something big and cosmic like that, um, then I certainly agree with you. If what you're saying is that, you know, there were certain papers written um, decades ago and those papers are still 100% correct and we should base all of everything on you know, these tablets that were handed down and any change would be populist and barbarian, um, then I think I, I quite disagree with that. Um, in fact, even some of the assumptions and arguments that people like um, Bork and Posner and others made, you know, economists in I.O. have long known um, that they were quite fragile and based on very specific assumptions that weren't very robust, um, that the world um, was much more complicated. As you said, Janet, um, people do take into account a broader set of considerations, but um, you know, to some degree, you know, economists need to do a better job of understanding this broader set of um, considerations, too. So I think this is an evolving area, as you know, the chairman said at the very beginning of the remarks. Um, I think that continued evolution is important. I think that if some of the macro evidence, data, and motivations that I said lends more impetus to that. Um, I think that would be a welcome development and an important one, um, but you know I still would then use that to motivate, um, you know, using you know micro market by market um, techniques to think about cases, not um, some of those types of macro data. But I don't think that's irrelevant in motivating us to, you know, push further and 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 think harder about. You know, ways that, and frankly, enforcement has gotten more lax and that has had um, deleterious consequences for the economy. Well, uh, Tim, it looks like you want to react. Sh sure. Let me, let, let me address the, the Chicago point uh, about the, the sacred texts. Uh, Bruce, Bruce Kobayashi and I published a paper uh, subtitled, Time to Let Go of the 20th Century. Uh, <laughs> And when did you publish that? Uh, 2014. <laughs> uh, I thought I think Bilal sent it to you. Uh, and what we said there, essentially, look, the way to think about Chicago is the way to think about the American revolutionaries. There was this revolutionary band of brothers, uh, but what they were, they were opposed to the old order, and the old order was overthrown. Uh, but once it came to running a government. You know, they split like Adams and Jefferson. Uh, if you take, uh, you know, a list, and we put this in the paper, Baxter, Bork, Bowman, uh, Posner, and Stigler, they, they either hadn't thought of or they disagreed radically on how to approach antitrust policy. Mergers, for example, those guys were all over the lot from the, you know, from the most aggressive Posner uh, to, the, to the most restrictive uh, Bork. Uh, and uh, the point was they just hadn't thought about it. Uh, and when they did, they disagreed. Uh, and so this idea, which is, which is ripe in this populist literature, that there's this economic cult from the University of Chicago which dominates antitrust thinking, uh, is simply uh, inaccurate. Any, uh, well, let's say any other reaction or any anybody would like to put questions? To, to I, I agree with Tim, but I also agree, Jason, that there, this has to be evolutionary, and it's not, we, we don't regard them as the tablets that came down with Moses. Um, economic theory has evolved. We've had three iterations of the merger guidelines, and the ones we have in place now 
actually reflect how the agencies have been analyzing mergers for quite a long time. And they introduced new concepts such as unilateral effects analysis that weren't in the original versions. So we do evolve, but I, but I am very concerned about the inability to discern the consistent thread that I found when I was a young lawyer. And I'm very worried about how clients are going to have to handle this stuff. Well, Jan, since you've touched on merger guidelines, let me ask a question that I, that I have asked people to think about. Um, and this is not meant to reflect on a particular administration or not. But, but in 2010, the, uh, the uh, uh, previous administration revised the horizontal merger guidelines and, and changed the, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, safety thresholds or presumption thresholds from um, uh, an HHI of 1,800, post-merger HHI of 1,800, uh, being under some conditions presumed anti-competitive uh, to um, uh, a level, uh, HHI level of 2,400. And um, I, I will say also, in, in fairness, I think Tim Yaris and I wrote an article suggesting that um, uh, some, some change was, was appropriate, and we may have landed at around 2,400. Um, but uh, let me put that out there. I mean, the, the, to be able to think the, uh, HA, the, the thresholds in the merger guidelines should be, should be adjusted uh, uh, downward. Well, I, I deal with the guidelines all the time, and my view of the HHIs is that they are useful as an initial screen to identify the deals that need additional scrutiny. And then they show up in the complaint if the agency challenges the deal as part of the basis for why they're doing so. And in between, we don't talk about them very much because we talk about competitive effects analysis. Where is, where is the real competition that takes place? And having numbers attached to it and squaring market shares creates a sense of precision about this process that simply doesn't exist in reality or in the way the, the guidelines are applied. So I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I, I have clients who come to me and say, well, as I run the HHIs, we've got an, an 1800, and then I discovered that they've defined the market in a way that the agencies would never agree with, and therefore the client has assumed something will be fine when in fact they're gonna run into a real buzzsaw. The, look, the, the, gu the guidelines do tell you something significant if you think, forget the HHIs and think about it. I heard John Baker give a good talk on this right after our, our retrospective analysis came out uh, when I was chairman. Uh, think about it in terms of the number of significant uh, competitors. Bill Baxter, we, we argued with him uh, when, he, when he put the guidelines out in 82, uh, six to five was his marginal case, and we wanted to make it five to four, but. Bill, Bill was a structuralist much more than modern people are, and he, he thought you know, that wasn't very many competitors, six or five. Uh, Jim Rill, uh, essentially, uh, when he put out his, his guidelines, made a, you know, much more of the focus that, that Jan was talking about. But when they did the guidelines in 2010, they were relying on data that said four to three was the marginal case. In, and in fact, John Quoka, among others, uh, had published papers out of the FTC's line of business data that showed the importance of a strong number three uh, uh, to ensuring competition. Uh, uh, but it's the marginal case. There are lots of four to threes challenged and, 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 occasionally, and, and, and occasionally higher. But it, it, it does turn on a lot of factors. But the number of significant, if you, if you want very simple tests, the number of significant competitors and how uh, uh, consumers react if they're significant business consumers. Those answer to those two questions predicts a fair number of uh, of the uh, of the results. And on the point of the number of effective competitors, the FTC has done a number of reports looking back at its data about the deals it challenged, the deals that it didn't challenge, and what the factors were. And those papers which talk about how many competitors there were in deals that were challenged, whether there were customer complaints, whether there were bad documents, a range of other things. Those are really useful guidance, and it's terrific work that the FTC has done. I wish the, the division would join in doing that kind of analysis. Uh, just, I mean, just briefly on it, and briefly on the previous, by the way, I, mean, I thought, Tim, you were much more modest about the Chicago School 
in this discussion than you were in your remarks. Your remarks, you actually claimed that it, they'd accomplished quite a lot in terms of changing the way antitrust was, and I think that's right. That was well, the chairman's remarks. Well, they overthrew the old order. Right. Um, that and, was 40 uh, years ago. <laughs> right. Um, but, I, but anyway, I don't think we need to, so I think sort of everyone treats them that way. I don't think one needs to relitigate that. I think the question is, do we need to make some changes? On the HHI, I would just do the average of whatever um, Fiona and, and John think it should be. Um, but you know, I think the argument for raising them also involved focusing and making sure you were refocusing and being vigorous you know, above them in terms of a screen and everything else you're taking into account. So I think it's not just the number but a whole bunch of other things. And you know, some of that's also, frankly, dependent on the courses, the courts. When you're bringing hospital cases and you're still losing hospital cases, um, even when you have, I think, unanimous commission voting for them, um, that means there's a set of thinking, you know, some of which was shaped in the past and is, um, you know, that needs to probably be modernized and, and updated to deal with um, deal with changing research, including issues like wages, which I think is an important one when thinking about hospitals. Well, but the FTC is, is mostly winning, as, as the chairman said, mostly winning hospital mergers. Uh, and, you know, the problem was uh, there was this silly belief uh, in the Alzinga Hogarty test, and, and we got Ken, I went to Ken, and, and Ken, Ken testified. He had very, two very simple propositions. He said, I can't believe anybody would apply that test to hospitals. And second, I can't believe anybody would pay me to say anything so obvious. Uh, and those two, those two propositions, believe it or not, helped carry the day. And, and two circuit courts very recently blessed the FTC's opinion. But, but Jason, you're right in the sense, because these cases are decided out there by individual district court judges, the FTC actually had to overturn some of the district court judges in, uh, in, in circuits. But I think the FTC's way of looking at it is correct, and it, and it, and it mostly wins, but obviously in the, in the world of individual judges, you can, you can get some variance. Let me, let me ask, I know Jim has some comments. Yeah, just real quickly, I think uh, what, what probably wasn't recognized very much in the change from the uh, 82 guidelines to 92 guidelines was the treatment of the structural paradigm uh, you recall in the 82 guidelines that a certain concentration level that the uh, guidelines provided there would be a likelihood of challenge. In the 92 guidelines, we said this is a presumption that's carried on with further analysis and went into then the other factors, including entry and, uh, and competitive, uh, competitive effects, competitive nature of the marketplace, which I think was a major, major change from the 82 to the 92 guidelines. I think one of the interesting things about the 2010 guidelines uh, very creative, and the revision was probably in order, is the distinction between the analytical framework of the guidelines and the analytical framework when the commission goes to court. The, 90, the 2010 guidelines are very, very, not to say critical, but somewhat almost dismissive of market definition uh, issues as a uh, proxy for, for the uh, base for the analysis. Uh, shortly after those guidelines were now analyzed, uh, the commission went to court. And if you look at its brief in the Polypore case, it doesn't appear that the 2010 guidelines existed. But they're very much the traditional analysis, 82-92 approach. So I think there is a distinction that one has to draw between what the agencies do in their analysis, which is obviously extremely important because you don't want to go to court, and the practice that the agencies uh, uh, put into their, uh, court, their court pleadings, um, which uh, are more traditional, because I think the judges have become uh, comfortable and uh, accepting the, uh, the, the analytical framework of the 82, 92, uh, 82, 92 guideline approach. So I think there's a distinction there that we have to be aware of. Can, well, if I could, uh, I don't want to uh, forget the, the other mission. Uh, uh, con, 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 actually, the FTC is a bigger consumer protection agency than in, in both uh, dollars and people than it is antitrust. And if you ever go out as an official, and, and we've got some here, and, and do an interview, unless there's a big antitrust case in the, in the press, the questions are overwhelmingly going to be about consumer protection. I, I, I think David is 100% right about n n not strictly non-monetary protection. I, I've 
uh, as a young scholar, I wrote a couple papers about how contract law protects subjective value. But I'm not at all sure you need to revise the, you know, the, the, the unfairness doctrine or guideline. I, I think another speech would be useful because the FTC has protected uh, uh, that, you know, non-monetary, uh, as, as David mentioned. The first, the first security breach case that we brought, when I, and it was when I was chairman, uh, involved uh, uh, Eli Lilly, where what happened was uh, a, a, a non -entrained, not just poorly trained, an employee who wasn't trained at all, uh, uh, managed to send out a list to the world of, I think it was 600 people who were taking Prozac. Uh, and, uh, you know, email addresses uh, uh, are very easily identifiable. A lot of people have their, their names, certainly their, their last names. Uh, and uh, obviously, we thought that was that was private information that ought to be protected. Uh, and uh, you could you could spin a case of of, of you know monetary loss. But uh, utility functions. When I talked about uh, those economists who trained me, Gary Gary Becker was one of them, uh, and he was one of the first to put other things in, in utility functions. Uh, and the FT, that's the way the FTC thinks. And and David's right. Uh, that the commission ought to stress that. Uh, I think you can read that in the, in the unfairness statement now, but, but, but certainly statements to that effect would be useful. Yeah, and, and, and to, to Tim's credit, Tim and Howard published an article that's a classic, I think a classic in Mark Twain's sense, uh, something that everybody talks about but no one's ever read. Um, <laughs> but, 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 in it, but I did read it, and in it, Tim makes exactly that point, which is that the unfairness uh, statement ought to be construed to cover kind, the kinds of behavior that we would think of as invasion of privacy tort. Uh, but in fact, oftentimes when a bureau director brings a case like that to the commission, there's real pushback. Um, and not every commissioner, unfortunately, is quite as enlightened as Tim is on this matter. And so I think that going forward, some clarity needs to be uh, injected into the process, either through a revision of the unfairness statement or some declaration by the commission writ large that these kinds of harms are subsumed in the unfairness statement because um, there are some cases that Tim actually uh, raises questions about in that article, and and the, the result was, I think you said, was sort of hard to reconcile. The the order was hard to reconcile with the complaint language. Cases like designer wear, errands, um, and that's because there was friction within the commission. And so we need some resolution of this issue because increasingly the harms that are caused through data breach other forms of revelation of privacy information are not necessarily economic in nature. And the unfairness statement should simply make that clear or the commission should make it clear in some other way. So I, I don't disagree. Well, I appreciate the fact that we, we had at least one reader. Uh, and, 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 but, but I think maybe the solution is the next time the commission brings a case like that is, uh, it, is just to you know, issue a public statement that, that, that interprets the unfairness doctrine. Or, or perhaps in these hearings and the sure. report that comes <laughs> sure. out. Sure. Good. Another good <laughs> yes. suggestion. Well, let me ask uh, Elisa, who uh, I think on, on this panel uh, counsels clients the most directly on these issues, if she's got some thoughts on, on this area. Well, one of the things that we hear from clients a lot are, what's, what's the law and what's the best practice? And in, in counseling clients, you know, we, it's the interpretation of the cases and really focusing on those fundamental policy statements. And so where you have the statement on deception and the statement on unfairness from 1980 and 83, which are very helpful and we continually go back to that. I think to David's point, modernizing them, even with current examples, rather than adding kind of the 75th, the 77th <laughs> document that you need to put in an email to client and what they need to, to address, I think with current types of challenges, both in, in advertising and data practices and et cetera. Well, well that, that leads right into a broader question. Um, and, and, you know, the commission takes, uh, I think, takes seriously its obligation to provide clear uh, guidance, business guidance and consumer education. So I wonder if, if folks up here think there are other areas where, um, you know, new, 
uh, or updated policy statements or materials are, uh, are, are needed. I think it ties in as well to the idea of self, the self-regulatory uh, uh, model as well. So put that open maybe to David and Elisa initially, but of course that is just as potentially true on the antitrust side. But. Yeah, well, let me just make a quick comment, which is the agency spends enormous amount of time on guidance documents. When I was there, the endorsement guides came out, the green guides, 300 pages of narrative. Um, these are, these, are, these are really important documents. We understand why regulated parties need the kind of guidance that the agency can provide. Uh, but doing a good do guidance document is an enormous undertaking. And there are areas where I think the guidance needs to be updated. A native advertising, I think, is, a, is an issue that the agency is gonna have to continue to grapple with. Uh, the green guides left a lot of questions unanswered. Uh, simply because there was no real consensus about what certain words mean, like renewable. Um, and so I, I, I think, I think co one core part of the agency's mission is providing the kind of guidance that Alyssa's talking about, that her clients need. Uh, it is a, quite a formidable undertaking, but I do think it's part of the, part of the commission's core mission. Right. And I would just say that, you know, while the reports are well read um, by, by private practitioners, it's the business guides that the clients use, um, the TSR business guidance, uh, like, it, you know, the green guides. Every one of those, I, I have some of those sections memorized as do some of my clients. Um, and so I think taking concepts like the 2012 privacy report and taking the unfairness statement and really bringing it up to date that would be relevant for the clients, the innovative clients that are thinking of how to use machine learning and using AI and using facial recognition and having a consolidated in some ways where the, the topics overlap so that they can use that and, and not feel like they are targeted with gotcha enforcement down the line when they are trying to interpret necessarily flexible standards. Um, and, and to do the right thing. Well, and this gets back to the 6B question, which is in order to issue some of these guidance documents, for example, the use of biometrics in the marketplace, I, I think the commission might do well to commission a study to get a sense of how widespread these practices are, where companies are going, what, what the immediate future looks like, because this is a topography that the commission needs to understand, but I don't know whether it, it has the the knowledge base today to issue a guidance document on these on these issues. You know, I I think uh, I completely agree about guidance and the, the the best guidance the commission gives is in mergers, and an area that is badly in need of guidance on the consumer side is data security, uh, and there's enough investigations and cases. There's over I think 50 cases and probably at least half that many serious <laughs> investigations to do, maybe not a merger guide, but at least the commentary uh, on the, uh, uh, which the, uh, the agencies did in the, uh, I don't know, 2006, seven timeframe. Uh, because, it w and something that would be important would be to talk about as examples, uh, and that can, parties can be disguised, when the agency didn't act. That, that's really important information because the complaints have tended to be vaguer and vaguer over time. Uh, and data security guidance, I think, is badly needed. Okay, well, let me ask if there's any reaction to that. If not, I'd turn to another uh, topic. Um, well, this is, uh, this, this ties into a question we got from the audience. So I'll, I'll raise it in two ways. Um, and I think this, uh, first, there's a, there's a common critique that, uh, the U.S. Has, has lost or is losing its leadership role in antitrust policy globally. That what we see uh, developing outside the U.S. is a model predicated on, um, on the framework of the uh, European Union or European countries, um, and that this is being adopted uh, by some of the newer, newer agencies and newer countries. I'd, I'd, make the, I'd make the same point, uh, well, maybe slightly differently, it's a question. Uh, what what can we learn from the um, and, and is there a divergence uh, uh, between the U.S. and uh, other agencies on the 
on the consumer protection side. So, two 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 part question, right? How, why why have we lost our leadership, and and why? Uh, and then what uh, what can we learn from other from other agencies, uh, both on the competition and consumer protection side? Let me start out with the competition side because I don't think I've done much consumer protection work since we put Joe Camel out to stud. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 there is a challenge here in the uh, in the global framework of uh, competition agency. I mentioned in my uh, earlier remarks a recent speech by Mario Monti, in effect uh, claiming that the uh, European uh, methods of antitrust, the European foundations for antitrust were far superior to those in the United States. Now, the challenge has been there for a long time. Um, I think there is a concern that uh, there is a divergence of enforcement, uh, enforcement principles and due process principles, substantive as well as procedure and substantive around the world, and one that's increasingly being, being, uh, being affected. I think that uh, the U.S. has not lost uh, its attempt, its leadership in the sense of the work it's done within the ICN. Uh, it's largely the U.S. Uh, pressure, for example, that put out the U.S. initiative that put out the uh, guidance documents on uh, due process through the Agency Effectiveness Working Group, U.S. leadership of uh, the Working Party on Industry and Cooperation in the OECD. It's had a profound effect and produced a major report on, on due process. So I think that we, we're not wanting up the, the white flag anytime soon. I think it is, responsible, uh, it is a responsibility of the U.S. in two areas to, to preserve, I think, leadership not only for, you know, it's not America first. Uh, America first sometimes can be America, you know, not there. I think it's America trying to present some of the principles that have underlied antitrust enforcement in our country and, uh, and, and our, and our uh, jurisprudential base to try and put those across. I think two, two areas where this can be done is continuing the uh, guidance through the international organizations. And I think uh, uh, that further attention should be given to the uh, if you will, the moral suasion, the, the publicity effort that I think is underlined in an initiative such as uh, Assistant Attorney Jal Rahim's uh, multilateral framework for uh, antitrust procedure uh, deserve attention. And I think the increasing uh, use of bilateral agreements on competition policy, bilateral memorandum of understanding is a good way to go about it. Uh, and I think uh, also that the, the agencies uh, need to be perhaps attuned more, as they have somewhat in the past, to actually engage in consultation and uh, advocacy, if you will, in particular instances where the uh, uh, agent, the uh, foreign agency, seems to be departing from a global, global accepted principle of procedure or substance, uh, and uh, and uh, and. Uh, in effect, engage in consultation is provided for in a number of instrumental instruments uh, of cooperation. I think those are important. I think that the final point that the agencies need to be concerned about, the United States need to be concerned about, is the problem sometimes of an agency action uh, being misused uh, by a foreign agency to say, well, you're doing it so we can do it. And there's a lot of uh, copycat misuse of U.S. agency, which we need to be, the U.S. agency need to be conscious of the risk of that copycat. Recent article by Karen Wong Irvin, Josh Wright, lists a number of areas where that's happened, following up on some, actually some consents, uh, being used as an expression of law. Bosch, for example, um, Motorola Mobility, Google Motorola Mobility by foreign agencies as well. The U.S., this is an expression of U.S. law. They misuse that and, uh, and have that as a copycat for the misapplication of, uh, of antitrust law. I, I, I wanted to uh, take that and ask Jason uh, uh, a question. I know he's doing a lot of work on artificial intelligence, and I, I, I assume big data is a part of that. And uh, J Jason, uh, is what's going on overseas, is that important for the U.S., and what should the, what should the FTC do about those issues? Um, I can tell you the answer in like six months. Um, <laughs> but for now, I mean, I think a lot of the issues around big data, the, I think the big empirical question that I don't know the answer to, I was talking about before, 
is if you think there's diminishing returns to data, then you're a lot less worried about it than if you think there's some region of increasing returns. And there's some you know, people that do computer science that say with machine learning, when you get past a certain point, you get to this place where you can you know, do the AI in a certain way that you couldn't do um, before you get to that scale. Um, if you have that, then you think you have to, do have to start worrying about data becoming um, a barrier to entry that there will be some you know, large economy to scale in the machine learning um, AI space, and that you, know, you have to try to look at issues about you know, who owns data, for example, and something consumers may um, you know, overlook and not fully understand and have those property rights defined um, more properly. Um, you know, on the other side of the argument, the you know in a world where you think it's intangible, um, you know capital producing things rather than tangible capital, it makes it easier to enter, and anyone can you know come up with their little computer algorithm um, and enter the market. So I think this question of is it just a really you know cheap the you know AlphaGo um, reinforcement learning, the latest iteration of it that DeepMind did, isn't that long or complicated a program? doesn't actually use any data. It just plays itself and generates the data. Um, you know, anyone in this room could have done it, although none of you did, including me. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, so if, it's like, so if technology is like that, then I think we don't need to be that worried. Anyone in a garage can do it. If technology is this increasing returns to data, then I think we do need to be more worried. And I, I don't know which, so I apologize. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll use that as a plug. Um, we are doing uh, two days on big data at um, uh, American University's Washington College of Law in early November, and two days on uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and algorithms at um, Howard University's uh, School of Law in the middle of November. So maybe you can come back. That'd be great. I mean, just to be clear, algorithmic collusion is a whole different issue from the yes. big data one and another. That ex 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 exactly, although we are having some difficulty separating out the people who do one or the other. But 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 <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, no, no, we we're going to devote a lot of time to it. And that was a key, um, um, uh, you know, one of the things the Podofsky report did was just sort of think about things that were going to come up over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, and that's part of what we're doing on, in in in, in that space. Um, let me uh, let me. I, Jason, because you have to leave, um, I hope this doesn't put you on the spot, but I, I wanted to raise it since you are doing some platform-related work, since you mentioned you've been doing some platform-related work. Uh, to, to go back to merger law, and, and you may have less familiarity with the doctrine, but, but get your thoughts on this. Um, you know, how should we think about uh, acquisitions of um, you know, new technologies by uh, established players. Sometimes we use the term nascent competition or nascent competitors, um, but it's it's a it's a it's something we're going to spend uh, at least an afternoon on, and maybe while you're here, uh, yeah, you have some thoughts. Um, yeah, no, absolutely, and uh, you're you're creating a real incentive to leave panels early. I think I'm going to do it from <laughs> now on. Um, it's working out really well for me. Um, <laughs> I think that's a that's a really important issue. I think there's a sort of long-standing view that everything in technology is evolving so quickly that there's no point in forcing anything because by the time you do, you know, it's changed and there's some new competitor and you know MySpace has disappeared or Internet Explorer has been dethroned or whatever else. Um, I think there's something to that. I think there's a lot of irreversibility too, though. It's easier to stop an acquisition now and change your mind five years from now and allow it than it is to take a company that's already acquired and split it up. Um, the second is, is basically impossible. Um, the first, the cost of making an error and not allowing the acquisition um, may not be um, that high if you can change it later. So there's a little bit under uncertainty um, a, a literature in economics is an option value of waiting when you're making irreversible decisions and, and allowing a merger um, is one. I think you have to figure out how to think not just about um, market share, but about the ecosystem as a whole. And if you're you know, buying up something that could be a competitor later, then I think you're affecting the ecosystem and something that you know, prices, especially if there are no headline prices, isn't a useful guide to. Market share isn't a useful guide to. Um, but it's competition for um, creating a type of market in an ecosystem. So I think that does require new thinking and probably 
under that option value of waiting, the uncertainty is an argument for more, um, not for less in those cases. Well, let me ask if anyone has a reaction to that. We're going to have a whole afternoon of reaction to that. But, uh, okay. okay, well, um, not to kick Jason off, but I want to thank Jason thank for you, Jason. coming. He made, he made a special effort to get here. So let me, um, we, unless the members on the panel want to ask each other some questions, we, we have a number of questions from the uh, audience, and, and I don't want to be too selective because we did ask for questions, and I, I would like to get, get to them. So if people are ready, um, we'll do it. Um, and Jason did leave in just the right time, um, but uh, maybe, maybe others can think about this either narrowly or more broadly. How, and here's a question, how do, we analyze, how do we analyze the harm to small businesses who rely on large platforms to reach new customers in ways uh, they never could before? Is that, that may touch on too specific a topic. But, but. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like a benefit, not a harm. Uh, if, if they're using these uh, platforms uh, uh, to reach people that they never did before. Uh, look, obviously, there are a whole, whole set of, of rules, disclosures, consumer protection rules. Uh, it, 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 it's important that the, uh, just from a simple contract law standpoint, that the, the contracts not be devised unilaterally as they, uh, uh, as they sometimes can be, uh, uh, which is, a, a, you know, a, a obvious problem under contract law. One of the things I'm surprised with is the number of times people bring me antitrust issues that are really contract law issues. I used to teach, I used to teach contract law. Uh, I don't think in the big picture sense that the platform, so-called platform issues uh, uh, need to be analyzed any differently. Uh, the, the toolkit we have is perfectly uh, adequate and, you know, it, it it goes back uh, decades uh, when the uh, you know when the new uh, uh, industries uh, were evolving. Uh, you know we're talking about going back to the 1990s. Okay. Uh, I, I took a little bit uh, f of, of this question to be focused on the you know use of antitrust to protect small businesses, and um, I wonder if other folks uh, have some additional comment on, on that question. Is that a proper role for antitrust, or is it just too hard for us to, to measure that particular factor in our analysis? Well, I, I share Tim's criticisms of the Robinson-Patman Act. I try to give those questions when they come up to someone else in the office. <laughs> or I tell my clients that, that whatever the right answer is, the Robinson-Patman answer is, is the other side of it. Well, let me just add one thing. <clears throat> you know, dealing with platforms is, is, is an issue that arises both on, on both sides of the building. Um, for example, I mean, you know, one of the ironies in the Google investigation were the companies that were complaining about anti-competitive conduct were the very companies that wouldn't have existed but for Google. Um, and, you know, that, that interaction becomes very challenging. Um, also, you know, some of the platforms have raise serious consumer protection issues because they are essentially bazaars selling multiple products on the same page. And so questions about deception, who's responsible for the deception, arise with some frequency. So I think one unsort of met challenge on both sides of the building is what do we do about platforms? I mean, you know, we do have, there are certain immunities uh, for based on content, but that doesn't really resolve some of the consumer protection problems and some of the antitrust issues that arose, for example, in the Google investigation. I'll just add, on the consumer protection side, when we're talking about platforms and responsibilities, and David, I hear you earlier in, tr in terms of talking about the limited resources for enforcement, some of the things that we've seen is deputizing platforms to be responsible for those that they let into the bazaar. And that may be all well and good, but there's a lot of interpretation and a lack of guidance on what is reasonable oversight and monitoring, what's scalable, 
uh, and and not doing a gotcha on that. So yeah, if, all we, fair questions. if we go towards that point, what I would strongly encourage thoughtfulness over is what are the standards to, to avoid third party monitoring, whether it's a safe harbor, whether it's other types of incentivizing, but clarity on those points. Let me, uh, okay, any other comments on that? Um, let me turn to a question that is, um, I think I'll, I'll direct it to everybody. It's a similar question. So the question says that uh, uh, former Chairman Muris mentioned imperfect information uh, in contrast to behavioral economics. Uh, but in standard economic models, imperfect information causes transactions not to happen. It does not cause buyers to be fooled. So here, I think here's the, the, the question. Aren't buyers sometimes simply fooled, and should they protected for being fooled, or from from being fooled? Um, and I, I think that's both a consumer protection and, in some ways, a, a competition question. But I'll turn it over to David first. I, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the commission has struggled with what is a reasonable consumer and what percentage of consumers must be deceived by a message. But you know, the the. <laughs> The, goal, the mission of the, of, the, of the commission is to prevent deception in the marketplace. And, uh, and you know, Tim and I may disagree at the margins about this, but I, I agree with Tim's fundamental point that the core mission of the agency is to protect against fraud. Um, and, you know, the, the statute doesn't really use the word fraud. It uses deception. Um, and I, that's, in my view, that's always been the core mission of the agency. The agency. The first cases the agency brought were consumer deception cases. They were the sale of silk, which was really cotton, and it was sold C I L K. Um, and <laughs> those were those were literally the first enforcement cases the commission brought. So I, I you know, this historically that's been at the at the center of the of the agency's mission. I would also just add to that, we have to reconcile what the reasonable consumer and the gullible consumer standard, and one of the other parts of the FTC's mission is consumer education. And particularly as we go through the emerging marketplaces and people are learning even about those marketplaces, consumer education plays a key role in that, so that we don't dilute the reasonable person standard. I, I agree with, with both of those points, but and let me take the, the economic modeling part of that. It's, it's almost 60 years uh, uh, since Ronald Coase's famous article, and the applications of that are all about transaction costs. And uh, uh, shortly thereafter, you know, George Stigler won his Nobel Prize, uh, significant part uh, for discussing that advertising was an extremely powerful tool for the elimination of ignorance. Uh, well, obviously, there's, if, if there's ignorance, we're talking about a world with transaction costs. Uh, and that's the world uh, uh, in which you need uh, an FTC enforcement, uh, 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 as I was talking about. Uh, and so the whole, this straw man that, that, that you, in the popular press, that, you know, economists talk about these, uh, you know, automatons uh, who, who only react, consumers who, with perfect knowledge who only react to price. That, that just hasn't been true in, in any sensible economic application to what the FTC does for decades. Okay, well thank you. Um, let me follow up on a, on a point uh, uh, David made as, as well about a Bureau of Technology in the FTC. I'm going to depart a little bit from the question. Uh, but ask, um, you know, what, uh, first, what do the other panelists think about that? Uh, is, it, is it something that's relevant on both the antitrust side of the house as, as, as well as the consumer protection side of the house? And um, what, what, what might it look like? And uh, I, I raise that. Maybe it's a little unfair because uh, I didn't raise it earlier. But um, we have, you know, David was a bureau director. Tim, as well as being chairman, was a bureau director. Now, how do you how do you set up these things for success? Really, that's maybe my question. Uh, I defer to someone who's been chairman. Been the chairman. <laughs> I think that would be the chairman's mission. Not. I, I mean, I think it will be important to retain some of the 
technology, infrastructure, and the bureaus. I mean, much of what the, the Bureau of Consumer Protection uses technologists for are forensics for investigations. Uh, but there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of value to having access to skilled technicians for the policy issues that the agency is going to have to confront moving forward. Biometric identification, things like that. These are difficult technical questions. Look, the, the, the bureaus are complementary. They're not substitutes. As the only person ever to head both of them, they are significantly different. They're different right. in their personalities. They're different in the career paths. Uh, and uh, they, are, they are in many ways uh, uh, autonomous. Uh, and it, it's important, uh, let me give you an, an anecdote. I, I wanted the uh, Bureau of Consumer Protection to do more in working with criminal authorities. And I unfortunately insulted them uh, and told them that they were being, they were too self-satisfied. Those were not the words I used. Uh, and uh, I, I regrouped, and after about a year, they uh, uh, decided it was their idea. Uh, and they now have a very successful criminal liaison unit, which, of course, they take complete 100% credit for, which is, which is fine with me. Uh, and it was a mistake. It was a mistake on my part to, to criticize them, uh, you know, in the first place. Uh, but but it's a wonderful uh, organization. Uh, it reminds me of uh, of working in OMB in the in, in the old days, where you have people who it's their career, uh, uh, and it's not as transitory as the as as, as the Bureau of of, of uh, Competition. But embedding uh, in the bureau, like 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 David says, would be a, a a very sensible way to go. Anybody? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, I, I will answer uh, one of the questions. Uh, following. There, is a, there is a reference in the question to the, um, the uh, Office of Technology Research and Investigation, uh, what, what we call OTEC, uh, which does sit in BCP. Uh, the question is, why is this unit insufficient to get the job done now? Uh, without commenting too much on whether it's insufficient or what job uh, they uh, are focused on, uh, we are, it is a very small group, and more resources would probably be uh, appreciated uh, by the chair and by the commissioners and even by the bureau directors. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll end with a question that uh, maybe I have, uh, and, and it's a real question given the difficulty of managing agencies. Um, do you think uh, the FTC should have more resources to do its mission? And maybe how would you, if, if you were to allocate those resources, how would you allocate them? So I'll, I have no particular, I, I, I'd like the private perspective as well as the, um, you know, the, the folks who have not been at the agency as well as folks who have been at the agency to, to maybe give some thought to that. I think a question like that to be addressed by me is like asking uh, the Protestant minister what he thought about the latest papal encycl encyclical. <laughs> but um, when I was at the uh, when I was at the division, one of our major major efforts was to enhance the the, the workforce at the division, uh, both from the standpoint of law and economics. And uh, it was it was it was shorthanded. When, when I got there, and we were able to build it up and I think increase the, the efficacy of, uh, of the agency uh, uh, with, with more resources. It's difficult to get those kinds of resources with all the other budgetary demands, and, uh, and, and we ran into a number of, a number of problems, uh, partly uh, uh, solved by, uh, by the, 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 the filing fee issue, but uh, I think uh, I think the agencies do need, but certainly the division needed more resources at that time, uh, sensibly used and sensibly uh, coordinated. Uh, for the commission, I lead to the people who work there. Okay. Well, I have a, a long-run view about this, and when in. In '81, when we came in, uh, we were asked to uh, reduce resources. The way to think about it is FTE. We put the put the agency on a path from 1800 to to 1200, uh, and uh, that's that's where it, it was when we 
uh, in the mid-'80s. When I came back in 2001, I asked for a comparison with the mid-'80s, and, it, and Bob had had about 1,000, had, had and it turned out in professionals, 1,000 and 1,200 were, were about the same, a very small difference. Uh, and it, what had happened, there was a lot of outsourcing and a lot of productivity improvements. Uh, technology had had a significant effect. I think the agency's up to 1150, something like that's that. Right, that's right. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how that compares with, uh, you know, with 2001. I suspect there have been some more productivity improvements, probably not as dramatic as in the, uh, 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 as in the 90s. Uh, but, you know, Bob did a, a hell of a job with 1,000. Uh, uh, I, I think we're headed for another retrenchment era. Uh, so I think it's probably wishful thinking to ask for uh, significantly more resources. And uh, uh, besides the people, there's ob the BCP, for example, has a significant infrastructure burden uh, that we managed to satisfy with, uh, uh, with the money from Do Not Call. Uh, which, which we used for uh, building up the infrastructure for Do Not Call, which was very helpful for the rest of the, uh, uh, for the, rest of the agency. Uh, but I, I, I think at the present, you know, the present rate strikes me as uh, significantly more. We, we ended up about 12, 6, or about 10, 60. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I thought we did a lot. I thought Bob did a lot. Uh, so I'm not... I, I, don't, I don't think more resources are in the cards, and I, I think they're doing a lot with, with, with what they've got. It's not from, a, from an internal perspective, but I think it's all about the priorities, right? Where, where do you want to focus the resources that you have? And some of the themes from today were we have division of enforcement, and we need more manpower in terms of business guidance. Mm -hmm. And I think to not get distracted by calls for regulation, which would take a whole bunch of people off of doing some of those things now, um, that may not be as productive. Speaking only on the competition side, the lawyers and economists with whom I work regularly at the Commission are incredibly dedicated and hardworking. The general populace has a view of government employees that is deprecating, and it's not fair. They do yeoman's work, they work weekends, they work nights. Um, and a lot of the competition mission is consumed with things they can't predict. What's the merger weight going to be? All of which are time sensitive. So they have to at least retain the kinds of resources they've got because you'll burn them out. Yeah, I would argue for more resources. I understand Tim's argument and I, I realize this is probably swimming against the tide. But since, uh, since uh, 2001 or 1981, Congress has added considerable <clears throat> workload to the agency. Uh, changes in the marketplace have required the agency to do more work. Um, you know, the Bureau of Consumer Protection at its height when I was there, and I don't think we've added any resources to it, had fewer than 450 people, uh, including most of the people in the regions. Uh, people work extremely hard. Um, they're incredibly dedicated, but there are lots of people with fingers in the dikes and the water is just coming over the transit. So I, I would urge the, the commission to think about asking for an increase in resources. I, I think, of course, most of it should go to BCP, but <laughs> um, I think the agency could, could well use a couple hundred more FTEs. Okay, well, I think, uh, I think we'll conclude right there. Uh, we were on... Uh, targeted for 11.45, and I think that's where we are. Before we conclude, I'd like to thank a bunch of people. First, I thank the panelists, uh, including uh, Jason, who had to leave very much for devoting some time and effort to this. Uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, the, my, my colleagues in the Office of Policy Planning, who have been working very hard <laughs> on what will probably be about 20 uh, days of uh, sessions, and this is only 5% of the way through once we're done today. Um, they're just a wonderful crew to work with, and I'm, I'm very proud to uh, work with them. And I think I have the best job at the commission. <laughs> um, uh, and, and finally, thank um, also the staff of um, the uh, executive director for helping put this thing together. And you'll see more of it this afternoon, but, but I won't be on stage, and I want to put that, put that out there. 
and then thank everybody for showing up and uh, paying attention. Uh, we'll be back here at 1.30, so if you can come here slightly before, that'd be great. Uh, there is a cafeteria uh, across the courtyard if people want to eat uh, uh, law school food. Um, but, 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 but it's good. It's, it's, it's better, than, better than I remember. So uh, uh, hope to see you back here, you know, slightly before 1.30. Thank you.